never lose in a booze. Yeah. And he's going to score Bristol's third oh, try. What a but what try. great that was play fantastic. by Augustine P. Shot. <laughs> and Bristol have made a bit of history winning the European Challenge Cup for the first time ever. And Bristol have won. They won the local derby. Hello, you're listening to Bears Beyond the Gate, a Bristol Bears podcast made by fans for fans, with two and a half season card holders at Ashton Gate, you love the club, the game and all things Bears. I'm Pete and I'm joined by Lee and Miles at the Bristol Beer Factory Tap Room for a couple of cheeky beers and a bit of rugby banter. Well boys, it's been a while, we haven't been here for a bit and uh, obviously we are in the fallow period with no games really to talk about, um, but... We got can't keep our listeners waiting. We've uh, we decided to do another pod today, um, and we've got something fairly special that we're going to talk about in a minute. But I think we'll just leave that hanging for a moment because obviously it's been half term. Um, Miles, I've noticed uh, on your various socials that you have been around the country. You've been to your little Devon residence. Um, and then you were up in your London pad this weekend, so uh, been a busy half term for you. Yeah, boy. absolutely. Left in the lurch by the by the Duchess earlier in the week. Where again, I had to, again, where I had to entertain. And to be fair, they are my own two children, plus my nephew. Well, that's what you think. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, took them up onto Dartmoor, nearly threw them off a couple of the tours up there when they were just annoying me. But we loved it. And then you're right. And then we joined the Duchess uh, up on the sh- in, in our residence up on the top of the Shard, where she lives uh, a couple of days a week, uh, and had a lovely sort of tourist weekend in London. I literally got back half an hour later gasping for some decent West Country ale, boys. Oh, my life. What with London beer prices. And you landed in the right place. And we place. landed in the right place for some, for some fantastic beer at the beer factory. Oh. Well, mate, that is, that is great commitment. And especially getting a train back on a Sunday night from oh, Paddington. Oh, it was hard work. It, it, yeah. sounds, it sounds miserable. So well done. Well done. And, yeah. and how are you, Lee? Good. Yeah, unfortunately, nothing that exciting for me in the world of self-employment. I've been working my butt off all week. Uh, I did have a nice... Day in Cardiff, though, yesterday, uh, which was nice. Uh, not not quite as exotic as the Shard and, the, you know, not quite as <laughs> nice a view. But uh, the Prince of Wales pub in the, you know, Weatherspoons, you know, top floor. What, you, you went all the way to Cardiff to go <laughs> to, a, to, the to, go, to, go to a Spoons? No, we did a couple of things. Oh, okay. we, did, we did a couple of things, but we did obviously end up at some point in a pub. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, oh fantastic. But good to be here. And yeah. we should say, actually, oh, Miles has just said about, you know, the, the quality beers, we should mention what we're actually yes. drinking, shouldn't we, today? Shall I start? Yeah, yeah for it. So I've got, a, well, I said I did have an amazing um, New Zealand IPA called Dune Twist, which I've, I've actually just demolished. Um, but that was beautiful. And you're on? I'm Pete. on White Desert, which I think is... Extra Pale Ale. Extra Pale Ale. Um, yeah, really nice, really smooth. Mm. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, slipping down nicely. Miles? I think I'm on the stalwart of fortitude, and you cannot go wrong with no. that. A fine beer. Yeah. And Pete, what have you been doing with yourself for a week? You've been, apart from you being a busy lad, in, you know, interviewing and stuff. Well, wow, wow. don't don't jump the gun. A little, a little, too early, Miles. I, a, a little trip to Twickers, I hear, I a couple did. of weekends ago. So last weekend, I was very lucky. Uh, went to see England. Well, I said I was lucky to go see England Wales. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was nice to be in a, a big stadium. Um, yeah, but stayed some, got some friends who live in Wimbledon. Uh, they're associated with the rugby club, so they got a couple of tickets. Uh, went to watch that, um, and then we stayed night, came back Sunday. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting. Uh, it wasn't a great game, to be honest. I don't think oh, I don't think nah, either team played nah. particularly well, cancelled each other out. <laughs> great to see Yoan Lloyd, young Lo- Yoan Lloyd yeah. playing, though, and uh, good to see how he's developed. He's, he did get a bit of criticism, but I thought uh, he actually played... He was, he, there was a lot more poly- positives about yeah. his performance. I, I thought I'd criticise his moustache, but I thought yes. oh, yeah, I mean, his gameplay. Was I mean, right, there was yeah. one where he got sacked like a quarter pack yeah. in, <laughs> on his line, yeah. and, and he got thrown. Uh, he got thrown under the bus on that one, literally, because it was Ollie yeah. Chesson or someone. It? it was mm. like a bus on top of him. Um, yeah, I mean, England's blitz defence was really suffocating the game for Wales, and I think he was just trying to do stuff. And you know, he's only going to get better. Um, I mean, the one thing I would say, though, an 80,000 mm. capacity stadium mm. and I didn't queue for a beer. Yeah. Oh, and says the, something, doesn't it? It is. Yeah. I mean, they've got it. Obviously, they, they are well averse at this. But what was really good was round by the Guinness tent uh, or the Guinness bar, 
there weren't queues. There were some queues, but basically they had people coming out with mm. pints of Guinness yeah. and with a, 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 pourer, a, yeah, yeah, a credit yeah. card thing, okay. yeah. you know, contact this machine, and you could just pick them out of, these, out of the people and pay straight but, away. It was unbelievable. I will say, I think that is the norm, no, Pete? Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, at Spurs Stadium, 62, 63,000 mm. fans and no queuing as well. Exactly. So, you know, it's, it's like something's not quite uh, right I at mean, Ashton Gate, And I know it? at Ashton Gate, yeah. we have had mobile beer kind of dispensers. I think once I've seen and them I just, in all the two years we've been there. I know, and I just think when you've got those big, big, big queues at the Dolman, if you had someone coming around the back of the queue, and they've got maybe yeah. just keep it simple, it's got mm. a lager and a cider yeah, or whatever, yeah. it will take some people out of that queue. Anyway, that's, that's another... Just, so, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. So, um, but, boys... What else, else have you been Miles doing? Miles has... And this is for our very good friend, Vader, as Miles has alluded to. <laughs> I was also busy this week securing our, f- well, I wouldn't say it's our first interview because we have had Pat Lamb on before and we've had Joe Joyce on before. Yeah, and, yeah. But it is our first interview as a trio. But it's our first TC. interview as a trio without Tony. Um, so it had that, uh, that kind of, um, that sort of thing about it. But actually, it was uh, it was with somebody who has only very recently left Bristol Bears. In fact, he retired uh, in the summer. Um, and of course, that boy is West Country rugby legend Dave Atwood. Yes. Yeah. So I did put a little t- teaser out, uh, I think on Friday or Saturday, with a picture of Dave Atwood without his head mm. and the bear, our Bears Beyond the Gate logo and did, did sort of tease. And I've got to say, I think one person got it, guessed it right on Facebook. Um, so yeah, so I sat down, uh, with, well, I say sat down, we were on zoom, but I sat down in my kitchen and Dave was in his living room and we had a, a really good chat. It's about 35 minutes long. Um, we talked about a number of things and, uh, what I think we'll do boys is, uh, if we play that interview now and perhaps afterwards we can have a little bit of chat about some of the issues that arose. Okay. So I, am. Um... Really excited to be joined by West Country rugby legend Dave Atwood, who has agreed to come and have a chat to Bears Beyond the Gate in this fallow period without games. So, Dave, uh, really appreciate you giving up your time for us. Uh, are you well? I'm very well. I'm very well, Pete. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me on. That's 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 fine. It's a pleasure. We don't we don't have very many guests actually, so uh, you are you you are kind of privileged. <laughs> Select crowd, a select crowd of individuals that uh, have made made us. Well, I'm very happy to join join the alumni. Brilliant. Okay. Well, look, let's dive in straight away. Um, I have uh, my first question to you is is basically what we've been up to since uh, retiring from from rugby last last July. Um, so, I, like most most people who kind of leave a long term profession, I spent a little bit of time wallowing in kind of self pity and doubt for a bit before uh, I pulled my socks up and and got about to doing things. And my uh, my time is kind of split in two directions really professionally right now. One of which is uh, I I run a, a bar, an Aperol Spritz bar, serving serving cocktails. I um, bought an old horse box and renovated it, and I go down to to the wreck at uh, Bath Games, and hopefully I'll be at um, Ashton Gate next season, and I'm also going to be at um, Gloucestershire Cricket over the over the summer, selling uh, Aperol spirits, good times, and good feelings to uh, anyone willing to participate. Um, and also, probably the main thrust of, uh, of employment for me is working as a, an associate consultant with Farley Performance, who's a, a like a leadership, culture, vision, purpose, organisational development um, group, and uh, just kind of helping people to be be more performance orientated cool um so you because i know you were you're you had a law degree as well didn't you or a law conversion you're yes. not you not doing that then or uh it's well it's very much in the plan the the long-term agenda so i i was like you like you you, you correctly said before that i i'm a bristolian born and born and bred i went to bristol university and i did an undergraduate degree in physics and philosophy um and then i put it to good use playing rugby and <laughs> Then I along along the journey, I decided that I was getting involved in so many sighting um, <laughs> hearings for for misdemeanors and whatnot that I should probably get myself qualified to to represent myself formally. Um, so I did a law conversion, very very correct. And I would love to go down the avenue of practicing law. I, I do. I, I love advocacy. I love the neutrality of of the law and the the kind of the quest and inquest for for fact versus fiction um but 
a career in law is very expensive in terms of your time. Like it is a, a, a difficult endeavor for a reason. Um, and right now I've got two little kids, seven and nine, and they are at a stage in life where they want to hang out with their dad. I'm still important. And there will be a time in the not too distant future where they don't want to hang out with me and I'm not cool. And um, it's important for me to to kind of be around and enjoy that. It's a, a privilege that I get to do that now. So I've essentially parked my ambition to push into law for now. And once uh, once the kids are a little bit older and I've got a bit bit more flexibility, then I will um, hopefully return to return to the law. Well, I've I've got two daughters who are nearly fifteen, nearly thirteen, and I can hundred uh, percent concur with what you're saying. So make the most of it before they stop talking to you. Basically, yeah. <laughs> so I think I know that's I know that's coming, and I know the 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 cost required in order to embark on that career. So um, it's very much something I would love to do further down the line, but I've kind of parked that ambition for now. Brilliant. Okay. Well, look, let's uh, let's take you back to I think it was February 2019 when it was announced that you were were going to re-sign. I suppose it would be for your your hometown club, having spent a bit of time with uh, with them down the road. Um, so I'm just sort of yeah. I mean, if you could think back that far, I was just kind of wondering what was your your kind of motivations at the time, and and what did you hope to achieve with the kind of burgeoning Bristol Bears thing that was going on. Oh. oh. I was in a I was in a strange place personally. Um I'd had this kind of behind the scenes fallout with uh with but the organization that is kind of Bath Rugby. And I'm I'm very careful not to lord that on an individual because it's never it's never as simple as that. If anything, I've really learnt in this kind of new lease of life afterwards where I'm kind of exploring organizations and communication and performance. There's there's no such thing as a simple answer to anything. So I'd had this um tumultuous time where where I enjoyed a little bit of time down in the south of France, uh playing with Toulon. And I came back and professionally playing in the south of France allowed me to see the game differently. I'd become very institutionalized. I was a very effective, long standing um professional premiership rugby player. And I mean that the Premiership is a very tough competition. It's more so now than it ever was before, but results are very important. Margins are very fine. Statistics rule the way. And I, I very much was a, an absolute flag flag bearer. And I went down to South France and there was a, just a different way of doing things. And rugby was different there was more opportunity less pressure more expectation more excitement and i came back to the premiership and that 2000 and kind of 18 season when i came back to bath from toulon was possibly some of the best rugby i played in my entire career i was uh, players player of the year fans player of the year forward of the year um there was lucas aid lucas aid player there was all these kind of awards and acumen, I was playing very, very well. But I'd had this big fallout with Bath and the the kind of mechanics that had already been set in motion meant that my time at Bath was done. That, that had been decided um, maybe partially by me, maybe partially by the club, whatever it was, that that was a, a done deal. And as, as kind of happens in these scenarios, you kind of, you, I was, particularly good rugby player at the time so you don't have to put the fees out too far for someone to have an inquiry or, or two and um i had a, a a tap on the shoulder from mark irish who i i knew from my previous time with with bristol he was he was the uh the scrum coach over over at bristol now under under pat lamb and uh there was very much a new way of things there'd been a big evolution with uh with what was happening at uh, at Bristol, and I uh, I drove across to to meet Pat and uh, and JT and and Iro and and have a kind of a discussion about the possibility of coming across to Bristol, rejoining the club, um, maybe fulfilling some of the ambition. Because I would, first and foremost, I was born and bred Bristolian. I grew up supporting the club. My, my kind of first professional contract was with the club, and I've always had a a soft spot for Bristol. 
like even in the the kind of dark years of, of the championship where it just was perpetual never quite i was always desperate for them to get promoted because i wanted to play against them like it it was a club that really meant something to me and now here was potentially an opportunity to come back and to do something really meaningful for them and not in an also ran kind of capacity like i i very much felt like in those com conversations early on there was genuine belief and rightly so of the potential for the club and thankfully we we kind of delivered on that but there there was a real sense of this isn't i'm joining bristol for for a paycheck and we're gonna like try and keep them in this not about survival i didn't want to be a part of survival that wasn't that was never part of any of the conversations I, I've ever had with people at uh, people at Bristol. It was very much about, I mean, we want to win the thing. That's that's where we're planning on going. So that was quite exciting um, from a conversational point of view. And it, like I say, it scratched that itch of it allowed me to be like a, a part of such a such a special place. I mean, I think it's uh, it was fairly obvious as fans that you weren't there just to, to kind of pick up a paycheck. I think um, I think it was well appreciated, and, I, and, and there is an argument to say we, we haven't quite replaced you yet, anyway. But that's a, that's another conversation. Um, so just yeah, I mean, you, you know, you signed for Pat Lamb. Pat was it was you know brought us up, he promoted us. We had the rebrand. I mean, you know, this podcast was kind of like a a baby of the the rebrand because you know it was it seemed to be a good thing to do. I mean, you know, we we've all got you know Pat's done a done a lot of interviews he's he's talked a lot you know he's he's a he's a very well regarded international coach i would say but i mean what what's you know how did you enjoy your time I and mean, what how did you find being a player there i mean I, I loved i loved being a player there i felt very much out of my comfort zone because i was being asked to grow in a way that i had not been asked to grow before and that lined up with my new narrative and experience of how the game could and should be played um, and it's difficult when you feel like someone who's, I've got a great CV. I'm 25 caps for England. I like, oh, I've 250 premiership appearances. Like I'm a, I'm a big deal. And here I was coming into this environment feeling like I was first day of school and I didn't know anything. And I was being stretched and, and prodded and poked and, and inquired of. And there was a sense of growth that I had as a player, which is part of, central to pat's philosophy on rugby like you you'll see one of the tenants is people enter the bears program and they leave a better player a better person a better individual and that's across the board it's not just your professional it's not just my ability to pass the ball it's my ability to handle adversity it's my ability to give back to the community all of these elements are central to to pat's philosophy in rugby and i respect him enormously as a person for holding that tenement so dearly i think he's a really really interesting character because he's emotionally very very much further on than a lot of people he can have a conversation with you um compartmentalized so we're talking about the fact that you your handling is not good enough and you'll feel like a mouse on the floor like running away, trying to hide from the boot. And 30 seconds later, you're having a conversation in a different context. How's how's the wife? Come over for dinner. Like the personal relationship and the professional relationship are different things. And they really need to be. And the people that get on best with Pat are the people who can understand that he's got to wear several different hats in his role as DOI. One, he yes, absolutely, he's trying to, offer you a contract that is as low as possible that still offers you value but he's also got 60 other contracts you need to assemble a squad to win the premiership he's not trying to give you a contract to make your life the best possible he's trying to balance all of these kind of things at the same time but at the same time he's also trying to demand performance and expectation and it's a very difficult job to balance those and i think for a very very long time he's managed that very well I and mean, you look at the the squads that have been assembled underneath him he's been empowered obviously by by steve and the lansdowne family but um a lot of that is is his management of people that's that's really interesting to hear i mean do you think that sometimes he takes too much on his on his own and doesn't delegate i mean, his they, I mean possibly possibly but there's a sense of responsibility like the buck stops with pat 
And that was one of the things I loved about my conversations with Bristol that at the time felt very disconnected from what I'd experienced at Bath. Like for a long time at Bath, you weren't really sure who to speak to if you wanted to talk about a new contract because there were so many people. Were you speaking to the head coach, the CEO, the DR, the recruitment officer, the the team manager? Like everyone seemed to have a, an opinion and be, mm. your agent was involved and all sorts of stuff. And at Bristol, my la, my so I signed a two-year deal with, with Bristol and I signed an extension under Pat and I was on my bike. I was cycling and uh, I got a phone call from Pat and – I was like, hi, hi, Pat, what's, what's up, mate? Right, It's like, Dave, we want to talk about next year. We want to talk about possibly doing an extension um, for a year. How would you feel about that? I was like, yeah, it suits me really well. He was like, what do you want? I was like, this is what I, I would like. I'd like this, this, this. He was like, that, great. We can do that. We can't do that. Done. Phone up. And that was it. Mm. That's how simple and honest and direct. And there was nothing kind of malicious or underhand or, or shady or grey. And there's never anything malicious but there's always a lot of gray and mm. this was a completely new way of doing things. It was just one person, one focal point. And there's a lot to be said from that, from a playing point of view, because the gray is where the, the disconnections happen. And you, you then start factoring why you think someone has said something or done something rather than why they have, mm. because you don't know and you fill in the blanks yourself and it creates potentially creates all this resentment because probably you haven't, they haven't said, here's a million pounds and a shoulder rub every day. So you're a little bit annoyed that it's not that. Whatever it is, you're a little bit vexed. Or maybe they're saying, we, you know what, we, we don't, you're not in our plans. We're not going to give you a contract. And now you're really bent out of shape. And you're like, oh, he's, oh, I hate Pat. He doesn't, well, he's trying to balance the books kind of thing. So it's never, it's never as simple as you think it is. It's a very difficult job. And I think, in a lot of senses, it's great that he takes responsibility for it, but it, by nature of it, it's an incredibly hard thing to do. And you know what it's like if you're trying to spin plates and one of them starts really wobbling, it takes more of your concentration. And now all the other seven plates, well, you haven't got any concentration on them, so now they all start wobbling. So that's the downside of of not being in a system that's well well integrated and delegated. Wow, that's fascinating. That's really interesting stuff. Um, I mean, obviously, at your time there you did have you know notable success um we had playoffs i think you were playoff semi-final against wasps it was, it was when uh then there was a european challenge cup final which was the only time bristol ever won a european cup then top of the table um in 2020 2020 the covid year and then of course probably to a lot of fans led to a quite a big defining moment in the kind of bears journey which was um which was the kind of tri- slightly traumatic loss to Harlequins um, at Ashton Gate, slightly twenty-eight nil up, which has been termed Bristan Bull uh, to as in, in in some quarters. And there are some people that would say that that kind of since that time, Bristol has, has regressed back perhaps to to the mean a little bit in terms of performance and and you know the the stats in terms of our league position in the last two and a half seasons kind of suggests it. So you were playing that game, Dave. I mean, when I look back at the team that was playing, it was an unbelievable. Um, squad. It was probably the strongest, one of the strongest teams that, or twenty three that Bristol would put out. Yeah. And I just wondered, from your point of view, you know, what what actually happened <laughs> that day? To, to kind of step step back a little bit, like it was. So the first year, like I say, was was the semi final. Um, by everybody outside the room, what an overachievement mm. for this team that was that had just survived, kind of. Um, by playing an incredibly exciting round of road, just survive the premiership to now be playoffs. Like, I mean, okay, wow. And then the following year, we we win the European European Challenge Cup. Now, that's that's the only silverware I've ever won. I've been been around a very long time playing some excellent, excellent teams, but campaign silverware, that's it for me. And that's incredibly special. And you don't I think often people don't realise how difficult it is to achieve campaign silverware when there are 12 organisations in in England, plus all of the other teams in Europe, all trying to do exactly the same thing. Everybody is trying to peak performance, best opportunities, get the best players and get the best coaches, all trying to do that at the same time. Everybody's fighting for one prize. 
and to to actually achieve that is is a big deal mm. and that will that that will always be like absolutely a career highlight for me um then the follow well i mean the, throughout throughout that season we're playing the best rugby in the premiership and rightly we run away with the premiership when win the the league as it were and then we get to the playoffs and it was interesting i i you you said it earlier the this bristan bull it was not a i can see where it comes from actually with um with a reference to to liverpool but um it's not a term i'd ever heard before obviously the game i'm familiar i, I was like so i was i was there um yeah it was a strange game because it really felt like it was the first time I really felt like our experience in those situations really counted against us. Like you so said, we had an amazing team. And on paper, I think most people would argue that on balance, we had a better team than, than Harlequins. They, as a team, have had the pedigree of being there before. A number of players in, in that team had been there before. And we didn't we didn't have that. And when things started to slip a little bit, I remember on the field, like looking at the referee and thinking, well, that's that's a ludicrous decision. But then now my focus is the referee. Mm. That's that's the issue here. And slowly that kind of sense of belief that we've had all year starts to ebb away. And you could you could physically just posturally you could see them growing as little mm. tiny little things just went against us and then went against us and then went against us, and then it's like well we're we don't know how to make this happen now. We don't know. We can all sit down and and write it out on a piece of paper, <laughs> take the ball over here and then do this. Yeah. But in the moment, we couldn't find a way to make make that happen. And there was a real sense as it got towards the end of the end of full time that well hang on a minute what's this isn't this isn't the way it's supposed to be and then we got into to injury time and it was i don't think it ever really felt like it was hugely one-sided but they were definitely the ascendant team for it and the sense of dis disbelief at the end of the game was absolutely palpable because for 105 minutes of that 110 minute endeavor or whatever whatever it was it there was a sense of obviously obviously we're going to win this game it's so obvious everybody in the stadium knows we're going to win this game apart from that really noisy group of quins fans at the wow. top who disagreed um and quite right they were their experience came through um and it was such fine margins that when we were becoming desperate we stopped being urgent one of pat's pat's kind of things is be urgent not desperate like you be in control mm. of different situations not desperate to solve a difficult situation and that that was essentially what what borders we came to the end of the end of the game you watch it now watch the last last half hour of that game and see how we're pushing the margins in a way that we've we didn't all season we didn't really need to do that we were were comfortable of manufacturing and trusting and uh, and that was kind of where it unpicked for us i mean it's this it's this thing called momentum isn't it and the, the one thing that isn't kind of is it's kind of measurable but not and then it's it's how teams can either get it back when they've lost it or whatever but i mean it's interesting what you say about that with the experience because i suppose from a fan point of view um uh, it's the same for us because we we hadn't really been there either because, you know, we hadn't gone to, nobody had been able to go to that Challenge Cup final because it was COVID. So, and I guess, and you rightly point out, the Harlequins fans, they got their peckers up in the second half. And they, you know, they, I don't know as fans that we did a very good job as well in this second half because, you know, it's a kind of symbiotic relationship, isn't it? The the, the, the momentum is is not just on the field. Like you say, it's in, yeah. in the fans as well. And there was, a, there was a sense of disbelief. You could feel it growing in the yeah. stadium of like, yeah. This isn't this isn't what we signed up no. for. This is what's supposed to be happening. We all know what's supposed to be happening, and this isn't yeah. it. And you could you could feel that. And the really for a stadium with forty thousand Bristol fans and two thousand Harlequins fans, there was one set of fans you could hear. Yeah. And that's the that's the truth of it. And I mean obviously we're central to that. We're the ones 
giving you a reason to kind of cheer. But it's not just limited to to the players. The fans feel no. that as well. No, I think that's a really it's a really good point. And uh, you know, so we'll we'll all take the blame then. <laughs> Sure, sure. Yeah, fault. it's awful. It's, it's yeah. awful. You know. Well, I mean, I've got a thing about rugby crowds. To be honest, I, I I think we're quite reactive rather than proactive. But that's that's another that's another podcast. I think to, it's, you need to manifest wins. Yeah, wins. exactly. Well, look, um, let's let's jump quickly. We haven't, we haven't got much more time, but just jump to the the the, the present, as it were. Um, I mean, I don't know how much you've been kind of following Bristol this season, but you know, we're in a kind of fallow period. Um, What's your what's your you know, take on on Bristol season so far? Well, I, I I will always follow Bristol, as much as my career is. I'm a I'm a Bath man, obviously. Um, my I've 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 got a um a, a a blazer that I've had for years as a Bath player, and it's got the Bath Bath emblem uh, embroidered, and I've got a Bristol pin under the lapel. <laughs> And I, there was always a, like it does. It matters to me. It's still, still, yeah. and always will matter to me how how the club do. So, of of course, I kind of um, I keep abreast of of how things are going. And the last couple of seasons, really, there there is a sense, like like you alluded to earlier, of the club lost lost momentum uh, with that with that Quinns game and has struggled to regain that. And there have been lots of factors certain players moving on, certain players being injured and unavailable. And there, there are always kind of reasons and the stars just haven't aligned in a way that have allowed the club to get its head above water for long enough to recruit the energy, to have a proper fist of it. It feels very much like it's like just trying to suck a tiny bit of air when you can get a split second and that just allows you to keep going a bit more and a bit, a bit more. And it's a very difficult situation. And, when that happens, like I said earlier, with the plate spinning kind of situation, one thing that's really not working and then another thing doesn't work a little bit and then another thing doesn't work a little bit and all these kind of factors conspire together, it's never as simple as saying, oh, well, we'll change this person or we'll change that and it will mm. work because a rugby club is like a spider's web. You can't just move one strand and put another one in it doesn't work like that as soon as you touch it everything else moves all the dynamics move you you think it's as simple as oh well, well what we need to do is replace dave atwood and what we need to do is replace samuel Drudger, and we need to replace charles peter but it's never as simple as a like a trading card game it doesn't work like mm-hmm. that because we're not just the statistics on the on the thing our relationships with the people around us all of the, that dynamic has to grow and develop and change again. And the core of that Bristol team culminating with that um, Quinns, Quinns game had little additions to a really embedded central group of players that grew and evolved with Pat over, over a really significant period of time with a coaching team that was very entrenched and, and very good at what it was doing. And in the quest for kind of evolution, there, there's been a lot of change. and some of the some of the people who've come in haven't been able to do the job as effectively as hoped they haven't and that's i certainly don't say that they like so a player hasn't come in and delivered as much as possible well that's not just on the player hmm. like a, a player's ability to to perform on the field is as much about the relationships that people like feed into that player and the environment that player's in as it is about that player and the environment they kind of read out. You see players going in and out of form, like that's that's what it is. So it's never as simple as that. There have been a lot of good signs, but those signs are really of people sticking to the plan and not panicking. And I think there has been a sense of panic at times in, in a lot of Bristol games this year, where even without understanding exactly what Pat's philosophy is for this particular game, as a as a fan, as a someone who understands the game, I know full well that that's not that's not what they should be doing. Uh, that's not what that player mm. should be doing. And there's a sense of belief and trust in the people around them and the system that's just not there at the minute. And that's a that's a difficult thing. If you if you could develop the secret sauce to feed the players at lunchtime that made that happen, you'd be a very wealthy man. I mean, which players? That's that's really interesting as well. I mean, which players do you think have have stepped up though this season that you've been impressed by? 
Um, who who has stepped up this season? Um, I am a huge fan of Jake Woolmore. I think he's been a very good player, but very underrated across the board by so many people for such a long time. I mm. feel like he's starting to get more credit now, and I'm really pleased about that because I think he's really central. I think Max Lahif has actually grown quite a lot for for someone who has borne a, a lot of brunt mm. over, over the years for, for various reasons. Um, I think that he's kind of stood up and, and been counted quite quite a lot. Um, I think I was thrilled that uh, Joe Batley came back because mm. I think he he's a great person in the squad, like really, really enjoyable. Everybody likes bats, but also his delivery on the field has been, has been pretty exemplary as well. And I think that's been something that they've missed with, with the absence of, of Chrissy and with um, not really replacing the, the kind of ball carrying bulk that's, that um, was left with Semi and, and Nathan and Charles. There's, there's been a real, a real sense of needing somebody to stand mm. up. He's he's kind of delivered a little bit on that time, on that front, which is uh, which has been great to see. And then probably to be honest, a, a little bit of the consistency. I don't think Max has obviously had enough enough time in the shirt, and we obviously know from his time with Bristol before how how good he is and how commanding mm. and how versatile he kind of makes us. But without ascendancy up front, which Bristol haven't really had all, all season he hasn't had enough time in the shirt or the armchair ride to allow him to do the amazing stuff that we know he's able to. So there are a lot of good ingredients there that kind of need a little bit more, a pinch of this or a dash of that to really bring the flavour out. And I think you'd be surprised actually how close this Bristol team is to having some really impressive results. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, we're not, when you look at the table, I mean, we're still eight, but we are only six points or so off. And we, how horrendous the premiership is, how tight it is. Yeah. Are we talking about, well, it's not a great season, Bristol. Like one bonus point win, and we're on four. Mm. No, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. A rough place right now. And things are going really well at Bath. But, I mean, considering if you were to read the fans forum about how great things are at Bath and how terrible things are at Bristol, the, in the table, you're talking like 10 points. Yeah. Games, two games, and now it's a complete flip around. Mm. So yeah, I think, I think the margins are very, very small. I think you're giving us you're giving us good hope for the the rest of the season. So I really appreciate that. That's that's uh, look. I think we'll. I appreciate you've got to go. So I, I've got one, fi- a, a couple of. Well, actually, looking at it, one, two. I've got five quick fire questions that short answer questions. I haven't told you what they're going to be, so it's up to you if you want to answer them. So, are you ready for it? Yeah, far away. Let's go. Here we go. So, I read somewhere that you are a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> yeah. And so he, when you were at Bristol, my first question, who, which other player was most like Ron Weasley and which player had Voldemort tendencies? Who was most like Ron Weasley? Uh, uh, I mean, clear, clear Jake Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. He's also, I, I believe he's pretty, pretty shrewd at chess. If you ever get him in a situation, get him involved. He's very good at wizards chess. Yeah. Um, and who's most like Voldemort? Just a bit evil. Who's who's a bit evil? Um, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus too much. Um, I think it would be giving him too much credit, but um, and Andy Wren, <laughs> he's more like. Um, Neville Longbottom? No, no, no. He's he's more more like a, a Malfoy. Oh yeah, perfect. He's like an irrit- He's not he's not a bad person. No, but he's you know he's got a bit of negativity and he likes to to point the finger. But there's yeah, it's hard to hard to say. There's a he's not a crab and goyle Goyle. goyle. He's he's definitely no, a Slytherin. No, not he's not big. Not no. Big, <laughs> no. All right, cool. We're talking about Jake Walmore. This is my next question. Is Jake Moore was promoting gin, Max Laheef posting Instagram recipes, and of course yourself 
promoting uh, Aperol Spritz. You know, is this acceptable for front five players? Absolutely. It's really uh, in the modern world. It's about, yeah. uh, like, ethical diversity and inclusion. Let's let's incorporate everyone. Let's embrace embrace everything apart from Max Laheef's little dogs. Fair enough. Yeah, and I see him walking around. Uh, as long as you've got a real-sized dog. Yeah. Um, he does have a bum bag as well, I've noticed, when he walks yes. around North yeah. Street. I, th- I think that's more because he's very forgetful and he needs a little <laughs> satchel all the time to keep hold of his trinkets. Okay, next one. Will Bristol ever win the English Premiership? Yes. Yeah, 100% Bristol will. They're too much of a juggernaut of a club. Like the setup, the stadium, the facilities, there's, there, there's too much good stuff at Bristol for them not to reap long-term success i really think i really think that's the case i think they 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 need some things to change and evolve from a from a playing squad point of view i think they have, and i don't necessarily mean that to mean the players but you you think like a, a harry randall five years ago and a harry randall now like the evolution of the player is is kind of night and day so players need to grow into this team and grow connection together and in a lot more meaningful way um, but there, there's absolutely um, some some sense of silverware coming to coming to Bristol. Brilliant. Um, one of the things we do on the pod is analyse post match interviews from time to time, and over the years we have kind of noticed that similar sort of cliches are often used, mainly by Pat, to be fair, but you know sometimes by players as well. I don't know whether that's part of the training. So I'm going to give you three of our favourite cliches, and you've got to decide which one you like best, and and maybe even admit whether you use them. So the classic, the first one is we'll take the learnings. The yeah. second one is we're not a million miles away, and the third one was fine margins, which you've already used once. So yeah, out of those three cliches, which one do you like best? The I, I take the learnings. Got to take yeah. the learnings. We don't we don't lose. We win or we learn. Yeah. And I think the di- the difficulty is cliches there for a reason. Like they're all true. Yeah. And they don't give you much consolation because what you want is a big problem and you can fix it. Yeah. Like what was wrong? Oh well, uh, Jake Warmer had no shoes on, so <laughs> next week we'll put some shoes on him and then we'll win. That's what the fans want. Yeah. But it's obviously, like I say, it's never it's never that simple. Like. It, or, organizational development is complicated and complex so you have to um you, you have to find a, a, a way of like <laughs> saying the same things when we, we, we lost why do yeah. we lose same really fundamentally the same reason we lost last time because all of our connections just weren't quite good enough and we didn't we didn't deliver but you obviously can't say that you have to basically find a way of saying yeah. hard. okay Fair enough. So finally, the last question, and this is a question that's on everybody's lips, especially if you follow a particular Facebook group. And the question is, people wearing dry robes at rugby grounds, yes or no? I (laughs) am 100% on the yes column here. (laughs) If you pay attention, hopefully very soon, you'll be able to get yourself an Apro bra. (laughs) Um. But I just think it's such a great solution because it's not such an issue because of the wonderful facility that is Ashton Gate. But if you're in an open environment, you want to be warm and safe from the elements. And you don't want umbrellas. Yeah. I was a big fan of the poncho. But <laughs> not very warm. So yeah. I, I think it's an absolutely great can't, idea. Can't you just wear a coat, you know, rather than a, a kind of surfing they're, thing? They're just not as waterproof. <laughs> yeah. Kind of thing, and also like it's more snugly. You can get your arms in, and I think dry robe is brilliant. I think we should do more to promote. I th- I don't understand why the bears haven't got a whole series of dry robes in bears colours. Like it's the most obvious marketing thing. Every fan wants a a, a to wear <laughs> the shirt. Well, put the shirt into a dry robe. Right. Well, we may have to uh, push that a little bit. So, okay. You can come on board and we'll have a little side hustle. You Let's and me do it. Selling uh, Bears, Bears, uh, Bears branded dry robes. Well, I think on that note, I think we should stop and leave it right there. And who knows what will happen. So Dave, like really appreciate your time. Uh, it's been really interesting and loads for us to, to talk about and uh, muse on. And I'm sure our, our millions of listeners will also be very, uh, very interested. Yeah, to hear you. Next week with some comments, don't worry. 
Yeah, I'm sure. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much for, for having me. It's been a joy to chat. So there you go, boys. I mean, uh, it was great fun. Brilliant. I mean, Dave was very was very easy to talk to, as you can tell. I mean, he was very honest, um, very insightful. I mean, we all know he's an intelligent guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I didn't know he had double degree in physics and uh, philosophy, which was quite interesting. Um, and also done his law conversion, but he was also done a bit of practical stuff. So, yeah, really interesting. Mm. I tried to get as cover as many things as I could in the time we had. Um so, I mean, what do you think, Lee? What were your thoughts well, after listening to that? First of all, I want to congratulate you, Pete, because I thought that actually it was so natural and fluid. You did a brilliant mm. job interviewing him because we, it was, you know, obviously you admitted to having a few nerves, which you would have beforehand. And, yeah. But it came across fantastic. Good. So well done, mate. Tell. Um, I thought there was loads of stuff that came out of that. I thought it was a brilliant interview. I mean, uh, you know, for me, like as a, a we're all we're all fathers sat around this table, aren't we? I love the fact that he's a family man. He's parked his ambition for the time being to look after his, his you know, yeah. to bring up his kids. I I love that. But the biggest thing for me was I love the analogies that he put in there, um, the spider's web one mm. especially, and it, and it is true. I mean, you can't take one person out of that spider web without. Mm all the other bits moving and it is true and it it, it, it it the interview gave us a good insight to kind of what it takes to be like part of a, a team a squad at that level didn't it and that came across to me yeah. massively and you know I, I thought another thing that really stood out was the fact that when Dave Atwood was kind of um, talking to Pat before signing he bought into the the ethos yeah. of the club. And I think us as supporters, when we went to the Q and A's and we all did the same, didn't we? Yeah. We all bought into, so we can't That's discount the, the kind of charisma and the character that Pat Lamb is yeah. to bring these, you know, these top class athletes to the club. Yeah. And he is a big draw. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Miles? I thought it was fantastic. I mean, let's sort of reel back a little bit because interestingly, I think Pete managed to get this interview by, uh, he bumped into Big Dave Atwood in a nightclub in Bath, didn't he? I'm not <laughs> suggesting it was in the toilets, but he, but he actually remembered you and I think you, you pinged him a few messages and what a fantastic chat actually, you know, commit to like, yeah, you know, doing an interview with some complete amateurs from a podcast from Bristol Bears. So what a fantastic chat. I mean, I loved it. I've just listened to it on the train back from London and was interested from start to finish. I, th yeah. I think you're right. To hear the fact that really that that really Pat underpins, as, according to Dave Atwood, everything that goes on in the club was. Well, I think some fans will be interested to feel to hear that that's like. They, some say, well, that's a that's a bit disturbing. That's too controlling in what he does. But other people might feel like, well, brilliant. He knows contracts. He knows what this player is being paid, and he knows what he wants to play in this player, and for how long. And I love the fact that, you know, he had a fantastic relationship with Pat Lamb as a businessman, a friend and a player under him. Uh, and I think I got the impression that he had massive respect for what Pat Lamb is trying to do. I, yeah, I like the way that he said that Pat is very good at compartmentalising mm, stuff. Yeah. And he said that he can talk to you in training about, you know, your passing needs to be better or your hands aren't good enough. And then five minutes later, he'll be saying, are you coming round for dinner? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, it was interesting. I think... You know, it's just I think for people like us and maybe a lot of our listeners who we don't have this insight mm. behind the scenes, I think it is interesting to to hear about how these things work and how how DORs who let's be honest do have a very very difficult job. Oh, it's, uh, it is sure. kind of yeah. reminded me actually the plate, plate plate spinning analogy mm. is that it is a really difficult job. On one hand, you're dealing with contracts, on one hand, you're you're trying to get the best deals for the club within a salary cap that's then changing, and then on the other hand, you're trying to deal with performance and results, um, and and also man managing people who are human beings as well. And uh, it's like Dave said that when he went to Bath, he, uh, Bristol, he left Bath because he wasn't happy. Mm. He was in a difficult place. He said he, you know, he was probably questioning his career, and it it really rejuvenated his career um, for a couple of years and got him another contract back in Bath. Ironically, didn't it? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I the think the, the the other thing that stood out for me was the clarity mm. at Bristol Bears because I mean we do, I have heard a lot of stuff about Bath, but maybe not so much now. But certainly when Ford was there as coach, 
you know the the system was quite there was a lot of people having a lot of input into the whole structure and obviously i think the thing that um was really important for dave atwood was that the clarity when he came to you know when he when he started talking to to pat mm. was this just like this is it, it, this is so clear this is exactly what he wanted mm. and not come in for a paycheck but actually come in to be part of something that we were building and hopefully we are still building mm. you know we've had a few setbacks but you know that it's, it's a fluid situation isn't it yeah but that clarity i think really stood out yeah i mean it was interesting that dave said that that first season where we got promoted then we we then got to the we got to the playoffs yeah, yeah. and lost to, to wasps and then went and won the challenge cup and then went and won the league in the in the regular season um and obviously then you know we talked about the, the harlequins game but i think actually it was really important that he reminded us how how good that was how mm, you know, yeah and probably you know maybe we did do it too quick because i think the interesting thing when i asked him about what happened in that semi-final was that he said that the narrative was we were definitely going to win that. You know, mm. everyone expects mm. us to. Yeah, yeah. And they had that belief. But then when things started going wrong in the second half and they lost their focus a little bit and the momentum went, he he said that they didn't have that experience of being in that situation as a team. They had a team of fantastic players, probably the best team we've, we'll have see Ever. for a long time, mm. Ever, you know, for a long time. But they hadn't had that 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 experience of playing at that sort of pressure. And I thought that was really because that's the the first time really I felt that I've I've got an answer yeah for what happened agreed and also I think we we were in that same position in the stands because we we'd we'd gone through that season hadn't we and we'd been yeah. playing some just amazing breathtaking rugby and I I thought all season it, it felt like a bit of a fairy tale and I do think we did peak a bit too early we were a bit in front of schedule but I think as supporters it. What you know, you kind of you don't want to remember it, but you you almost <laughs> no. you know with the interview, it was it's almost good to get this out in the open there. But mm. I think I remember us in in the stands, and almost when Quinn scored just before half time, straight away there was just that little bit of doubt mm. in all mm. of us. Yeah. And I think we didn't help the team on the pitch, you know, because I like that train of momentum that was just it, it just completely went. Didn't it? It's like for, Dave said that he could hear the Harlequins fans. Yeah. And, and fair play to those they were, Queens yeah. fans. Yeah. There weren't many, but they were loud. But, and I did, that was why I said, I think it kind of struck me as I was talking to him that, that we also had a part to play in that or not to play as the, the case may be. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And of course, you know, since then, things, you know, but as I said, it's been a, it felt like a bit of a defining moment. And obviously other factors have come into play, like the, the, the reduction of the salary cap, like the fact that some of our big signings were injured and didn't play. And, yeah. and, and we are kind of, I mean, my impression was that he was basically saying to me, you've got to be a bit more patient. Yeah. Pat has got this ability to build another team, which we may come on to later. And I, I felt that, I, I felt that he would have told us honestly what he thought oh, I and I think yeah. the impression we got was that he's like you know fans you've got to stick with it when you've got a good thing sometimes and it is a it is a debatable point that but it was quite interesting to get his perspective and mm. I don't think Dave had any particular agenda to follow no uh, because he's got a new life and he's got a new direction yeah, and, and yeah. so I think he was being honest I mm. genuinely do but you know I, I think you're, you're absolutely right what Dave Atwood has said I don't think they felt as if they had ascended should have ascended so quickly to get silverware and it's flipping hard to do so however this is what pat has promised players and fans isn't he from day one going back to that q a and we achieved it we got challenge cup we finished first in the premiership um and you know and, and dave atwood has moved on since then uh, we will go on to chat about this in future pods but then there's a, 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 a realigning of where we're going to where we're going to be as a club and this is probably the fans' ultimate question. If we are on a bit of a sort of dip at the moment, when when does Pat think we're going to ascend again to some silverware or winning the Premiership? And I just don't think we don't know as fans. Uh, and maybe this is something the DOI, like you said, he's all commanding, he knows everything, just needs to let us know. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think almost we need a... You know, we're talking about the clarity mm. when Dave signed. 
we almost need a kind of new clarity now mm. as to to you know the that's boss gone in the past, mm -hmm. but this is the plan from now. And I, I I would totally agree with Miles on that. If we got some, I know, and it's all it's not set in stone. Like, yeah, yeah. Pat Lamb says it, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Right. But at least us as supporters kind of know we're not just drifting. Yeah. You know, I mean, there is a bigger plan and there is a, a new plan. And I do feel, when we've spoken about this the last couple of weeks, Pat Lamb will get time. He won't be sacked. He will get time to build, to rebuild a, you know, a, a, a Lamb 2.0. And I think it's, it's vitally important now what that we, we get ahead of the curve again, because there's a lot of teams doing a lot of good stuff. Mm. And, you know, I feel if we can kind of, just get back to that kind of clarity again it'd be great i like the fact that i i i asked you about the cliches at the end like which is your out of yeah. those three <laughs> yeah, i like, loved it and, and he and he answered that well because he basically said the thing about cliches are they're essentially true yeah and he yeah. said there is a balance you've got to strike in those post matches you can't you you use them because you're basically making the point that that's what happened mm. but you can't go too far into it because you know, it's soon off the game, and and it's you can't let away too many secrets. But you're right because right, Pat can't say we were absolutely shit. Yeah. It was dire. You know, worst game I've seen. You're right. So, and as annoying as us three find these flipping cliches, I guess where else do you go from describing games that you need to improve next time? I mean, it is difficult because you can't reinvent new words every week no, to, no. to to keep going over the same dismal kind of performances. But I mean, I think as well in that Quinn's game, something that gets kind of bypassed a lot. You know, Quinn's got in to the playoffs through the back door, and they had an amazing run yeah, of results. Yeah. And you know, we we see it a lot in football. I mean, you know, we're football fans. You see it a lot in football. The team that gets just squeaks into that, you know, has a good run, squeaks into the playoff positions, ultimately then go on and achieve. And I think we we got sucker punched mm. by by yeah, a, by a yeah. good Quinn side who actually in that second half got all their realignments right and and played us off the park really. And I remember it was players like Facker just like trying to run with one leg, mm, you know. Yeah, and yeah. we we were just done, weren't we? Yeah. But, no, I mean it's 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 interesting. And there was the other phrase that he said that we haven't heard from Pat actually the one it was a new phrase that we haven't heard that's obviously a behind the scenes one is is be urgent and not desperate yeah. and that was quite interesting because he obviously you know, said that you know we got desperate in that second half and um, I kind of in, that's interesting but again it, it's it's execution I mean I don't know if, talking about execution of bold plans I don't know if any of you boys watched the cricket today but <laughs> I've, no, it was, I've not seen any today. it was I mean it's yeah. Anyway, it was, but that was a, a situation where, you know, Basball as it's called, which isn't really anything. It's a media name. Yeah. Is about make, taking opportunities, and but the way that England threw their wickets away today was just was just shocking. But that was quite a good example of being desperate. But and, you know what? I, that's perfect, yeah. right, for me to step in on this because I actually don't mind losing games if you're committed to yeah. like if that's what you set yeah, your stall yeah, out to do. If we set our stall out to you know to run the ball, that's what we were doing years yeah. ago when we when we were actually winning you know when we were actually achieving. I don't mind if we set our stall out to do that and we lose, so be it. And it's just execution. I mean, it's funny. I mean, I know we're talking about rugby, but Ben Stokes has basically come out today and said, you know, we we're not going to change our strategy. Yeah. We just didn't execute today. Yeah. And it's a bit. I mean, that's the interesting thing about what's changed with the Bears, perhaps, is that and and. Pat has kind of admitted that on TV is that mm. how he said that he felt obliged to go to a more pragmatic kicking game. Um, and that hasn't, you know, perhaps that's, the, you know, that hasn't worked quite as well, or perhaps that's going to take a few more years to, well, again, to the develop execution. the kind of, and we just aren't executing. And if you execute well, um, then, then, you know, that it's a results game, isn't it? Everyone's happy. So. But, yeah. but essentially yeah. we've got a team that can run the ball. We weren't yeah. really no. suited to kicking. Kick it, exactly. no. So we can, you know, it's, it's, so it's, I think, I think it's, it's interesting. I think it's, uh, I think I, I kind of came out of that interview with Dave feeling a little bit more positive about yeah. the future yeah. and also feeling a little bit like, I know 
as fans we are we haven't got any choice but to kind of speculate on things we don't really know about but at yeah. the same time i did say to dave you know we it is frustrating for us when we get those clichés because we can see that with our own eyes mm-hmm. and we're we're not the analysts we not, we haven't got laptops to analyze it so we do need some clarity and i think clarity yeah. is is the thing i think you said this earlier Lee, is is exactly the thing that everybody needs so that we can see where we're going and then you can you know you've got a reference point and then you can you can judge things on that reference point exactly. but i think in the last couple of seasons we've been a bit in the dark about whether or not that is a good game or not a good game. Yeah. And the inconsistency is so stressful for us because, you know, we play terribly against one team and then play brilliantly against another. Yeah. It's like, where, <laughs> what is the plan another, then? What is the, yeah. we, haven't, we don't know whether that's significant or not. But I, I, do, I do believe that is because we're kind of caught at the moment in, in mm. between a rock and a hard place because Pat has addressed that kind of situation of, you know, we'll, we'll kick the ball more, but it's not actually what we... No. set out to do is it so yeah. I think at the moment we're, we are the inconsistency stems from from that yeah it's just the fact that we're we would be more consistent if we, we if we played more consistently yeah. to our own game but one thing I did and it was positive at the end yeah I you know obviously Dave saying that we you know he, he does firmly believe that Bristol will win the premiership um at some point in the future but it's like he said you know talking about Max Malins ascendancy up front will then give us the power base mm. to unload yeah. the backs. So we've got yeah. so much potential in the backs. It's unbelievable. Yeah. But we do need that ascendancy Solid up platform. front to start with. Yeah. So actually, I mean, that's all the kind of the jokey stuff. Now let's talk about the serious things Dave said. Uh, Ron Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, Jake Warmore. I mean, I sat that. I, I, yeah. I chipped that one over for him to volley it top yeah, corner. Absolutely. Although he, he does rate Jake, doesn't he? I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I like gave me a bit of a... highly of you know, I, I kind of feel sometimes we haven't given him enough credit for... for Plugging well, we, away over the years. We love Jake, Jake don't we? Yeah. I mean, we used to buy him half a uh, Coke after the yeah. game, didn't we? In, yeah. in the days when yeah, we could yeah, actually see the players. Yeah. In the flesh. Um, and then, but I did laugh about the, I mean, I came up with that thing about who's a Voldemort, a bit evil. And he was, he, he, I hadn't told him about these questions. So he had to think this on the top of his yeah, head. Yeah. And I did love the fact that he said, it's giving Andy Arendt too much credit <laughs> to be Voldemort. He's not that intelligent, <laughs> but he's more of a Malfoy. He's more of a, he's definitely a Slytherin. And uh, that was quite funny because Andy Uren seems to be the butt of a lot of jokes. <laughs> so maybe that's the reason he, he left. He's gone and he's, maybe uh, it's like the cliches. Yeah, like the cliches. And of course, I finished off the interview with well, the, the most the, serious the, the most serious point of all, which was uh, dry robes at rugby matches, yes or no. And this and is where he, he disappointed he himself, didn't he? he let himself he did I mean, I'm surprised you nearly, you know, didn't delete the interview. <laughs> I cut him off. Wow, well, I, I almost <laughs> shut him down. I hope so too. I, I, he, was, he was like, did you not hear? Because I think I said, when he said, well, yeah, they're good. I said, but can't you just wear a coat? Yeah. Rugby and, he's, yeah. and he was like, yeah, but you could get all snuggly. I mean, what sort of answer was that? What is Dave on? But then he did say that actually he couldn't believe that Bristol Bears weren't selling branded dry robes. Which, is, he's a, which is a good point. Because he's a bright, you know, he had his marketing yeah, head yeah, on. Yeah. And, he, and he kind of, he kind of uh, suggested that the, there might be some Aparo bar uh, branded ones yes. coming out. And he even invited me in to uh, for a side hustle. Uh, and I was thinking, actually, we could have dry robes bre- bears logo on one breast mm. bears beyond the gate logo on the other apero on the back on the other so is that easy for you to sell yourself i've then? just sold i've just sold everything <laughs> my whole principles well gone actually out. sold well, his soul when yeah. dave suggested it's because it's just oh dave that <laughs> for money dave saying me and you on a side hustle i'm thinking <laughs> principles out the window uh, but anyway, oh, I mean, mate. I was a bit. I've One interview, say, and, and it, he's, let it, he's let his true was, sort of this self is slip. Be hasn't difficult he? to come back from. <laughs> is, oh, well, I mean, it's. It, I do think that the oh, well, reality is the genie's out of the bottle now with dry robes. Mm. I don't think. It, I don't think there's ever any going back, and I just now wonder whether we need to make the most of it. We need to. We need well, to. Do we squeeze. wear them in summer. Well, I don't know. It's a, it's a debate that's got to be had. But I I I don't know, Dave. I was expecting Dave to be a little bit more critical, and I was I was I was a little bit flummoxed. <laughs> but anyway, boys, I mean, it, as you say, it was a really interesting interview. Uh, I, I first one we've really done that we'd say is kind of an in depth, yeah, deep yeah. dive, as they say, yeah. into and we really real stuff. It. And one hundred percent appreciate yeah. Dave doing. It. He was so easy to deal with. Um, I also thought for this pod, 
we kind of talked a little bit about it being a season so far, but actually, because it feels like I can barely remember what we've done, the <laughs> yeah. best way of doing this was was to throw out a few ideas to listeners and see if any, they had any questions. Yeah, and, idea. and some of them, and, and we did get a good number back from our regular um, our regular questioners. Um, so I thought maybe to what we could do is just read through some of the questions and see if we got any answers for them. Um, so we never we, have answers. Well, we don't have answers. <laughs> but we can muse. We can have our opinions. opinions. opinions so I'm going to go with. I'm going to start with two that were two similar questions. One from a good friend of the pod, Ryan Keisha, who I did see at the Crusaders game. Oh, did you? Um, so hello, yes. Ryan. He yeah. said hello. Had a quick beer with him and his dad um, and his mates, and then also Chris Gingell, who. I also have some connection with. He's a, a mate of mine. It's his brother-in-law. Um, so they both asked the question. Well, Ryan said, "Will Chris Vuey play for us again this season?" And Chris said, "Do you reckon we'll ever see Chris Vuey in a Bristol shirt again?" And what do you think of the way the club has communicated with fans about it? I'll, I'll say, what do you think, Miles? <laughs> Flipping out. Um I think we, we, it's clear now that we're not going to see him for the rest of the season. Um, we can speculate. Well, we have to speculate. Because the little information that the club have given us, and I, yeah, understandably, family issue is it, just too broad. Um, excuse is a bit harsh, isn't it? But too broad a sort of like reason why we're not seeing him. I'm afraid, and unfortunately, um, it, it's adding to, to all the uh, speculation. And this is it's exactly why fans are speculate. We loved him as a player and a person. Uh, you know, and, and we we're, we're missing him um, yeah. in, in the pack. That's obvious. That's why we are. You know, it, it spreads rumours, misinformation or lack of information, just gets fans talking, good or bad. Um, so I, I fear that we it's gone on so long that we won't see Chris Vuey in a Bristol shirt again. And at some point down the line, it, it will come out, mm. and the club are going to have to come clean. What went yeah. on with with the Vui project? And yeah, I sad think, as it is, but I don't think I can add much to that. I no. think it's there's not a lot we can say, not but really. let's just just just. I, don't, be I agree. More chance of seeing him in the co-op on the yeah. street than there is yeah, in a very yeah, shirt. Exactly. Okay, well shame. let's get on to the next one. Our, our good friend of the pod, Councillor Steve Smith. Uh, Excellent. He's done some great touch. work on Canford Lane. Uh, the, all the road Excellent. works there. Well done. No potholes up there. Well done, Councillor. <laughs> well done. Yeah, Lee, you, well, you drive around Bristol a lot more than we do, and, and well done, Steve. But um, he has said, what have the seven teams above us got that we haven't? Okay. I'd say Ooh. more points. A <laughs> 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 state in the obvious, yeah. yeah. But I, I just feel at the moment, I think probably clarity and, yeah. and a better kicking game for a lot of teams. Um, consistency. Consistency. But having said that, I do feel there's hope that we're not a million miles away from, you know, top six, top four. And in fact, as as Dave Atwood rightly said, we're only a couple of bonus point wins away from being in the mix. Yeah. Now, I know it still feels like we're a million miles away at the moment because obviously our consistency Five isn't margins. there. Mm. So, yeah. So it's not like we're winning games comfortably, but... You know, I, I feel at the moment we still we still got games to go, and they're still to, we're still in there. To paraphrase a great cricketing uh, commentator, uh, is that there's only three things that we don't have that all the other teams have, and that's <laughs> passing, tackling, <laughs> kicking. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I think that's point, a good you know, you look at the table, points against. That's been, um, you know, our sort of like yeah. Achilles heel, isn't yeah. it? Although, really? That's a great though, show. Having yes. said that, there are other teams with a lot of points against, but defence, I mean, you you know. We've won six, lost six. We've got points differences plus 27, to okay, be fair. I think, now. I think uh, that, that Saints game, game helped. <laughs> but, well, Bath game didn't really help that much, <laughs> oh, did it? Because it was against. Um, yeah. We've got four try bonus points and two losing bonus points from from 12 games. And but we're three points off sixth and six points off fourth. So yeah, we'll see, Steve. Uh, I mean, you know, I think Lee's got it, knocked it on the head. Clarity, cohesion, consistency. We just haven't quite got that, and the kicking game hasn't been quite as good. And maybe we haven't just bossed up front enough to mm. to unleash the backs. And and when we have, we've looked looked a million. A mi- we haven't been a million miles away from looking no. a million dollars, have no, we? No, exactly. Right. Next question. Um, here we go. We are Tom Hughes with Sheedy going. Do we assume we are shopping for another 10? If so, who would be top of your shopping list? Not sure if he's available, but love the way Santiago Carreras plays at Gloucester. Mm. 
would fit in well with the way we play. So I'm going to throw that over to you, Lee, because you you put something out a while back on on our t- Twitter feed about uh, you know tens and replacements. What do you think? Yeah, I feel that we we have to have a quality ten to back up, um, to not to back up actually, but to compete against AJ. Um, I mean, AJ's what is he now? Thirty one, thirty two ish. So, I mean, it's not going to be around forever. And I do feel we, we, we do need a, a top quality 10 that will fight alongside him. I should say that also we had a similar question from Charlie Andrews. You said the same thing, but do we trust McGinty, Worsley, Jimmy Williams, or even Bernard Yancey van Rensburg after his little cameo um, against Bath? If we need to. So do we need another no, I, big I, signing? I feel that these guys can step in. But I, but personally, I feel that we need a, a an out-and-out out 10 who, who is going to compete and, and sign and, and go for it the first-team jersey to start with. It does feel like all the other teams in the league do have an out-and-out out superstars number 10, don't they? You know, and they've, Some of the teams have brought players on. Like It's just an example of Finn Smith at Saints or something. He's done phenomenally well. Um, you know, and the, the big signing at Leicester, Pollard, etc. Mm. Um, they just, yeah, and, and Finn Russell's a prime example. They are, I assume, one of the highest played positions, and they've just got that some that little mouse at number ten. That the secondary players or the players who step up from the centre haven't quite got. You can command a game in tight tight moments, you know, and I, and I think you're right. Absolutely. We need to back up from Asia. He had nearly a, you know, a season-long injury, first game of the season. And look where we are. We relied then on um, Callum, didn't we? Yeah. Pressure was on his soldiers and, and his form started to dip a bit. I, I think I agree. I think we need to um, yeah, be in the market for a sort of world-class number 10. That's not to say that I don't think Worsley can step up. I just don't think he's ready just yet. I think that, that chasm almost between McGinty being mm. where he is and Worsley coming up, I think yeah. it's too big to... And I'm not a big fan of playing people out of position. I think, no. I think you know, we we know Jimmy Williams is a great player mm. and he is a good 10, but he's not playing there consistently. And we know Bert Bernard's not a 10. I just think there are some certain positions that are so key, like Miles said, and, and yeah. you know, you're, 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 you're string puller, like a tight head prop, you know, like a, a scrum half, like a... Uh, a number 10 is important which kind of takes us to another question with, which was Marcus Watts very good friend of the pod um, he seems, says that we now seem to have committed to Pat for next season and I think mm-hmm. it's, that's pretty that's good if no improvement how far into the season do we st- I assume he means next season do we yeah. wait for a change um, how badly do you think the uncertainty or has, or are, I think, repat, and this is a difficult one. We don't know whether there has been really in the rugby world uncertainty, but how has it affected recruitment for next season? Because we haven't, we've given, we've announced virtually nothing so far, although I suppose we have announced Bill, Bill Matter, Matter yeah. Yeah. and we have announced the young, younger Grondona. And I suppose you could argue that the older Grondona is going to be like a new signing yeah. when he comes yeah. back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, I think that hints at, the, the type of game plan that Pat is, wants to implement for next season mm. it's definitely going to be more grunt there's yeah. going to be more you know, there was some talk nastiness. about that have we, signed, have we definitely signed that London Irish um, love prop joy. Yes. love joy uh, that seems to be suggested no, it's we not had. Been announced, but we've got but the, the Quinns guy haven't we um, um, is it Quinns oh, I'll have to double no, check that yeah we? but yeah it's, I mean I think I think you're right it looks like we may be going I would say a bit more grunt mm. just because going back to what Dave said in his interview, you know, you, you need forwards to unleash the backs. I think yeah. we've got some great backs. We yeah. know that. And we just need to get just that balance up front. You know, we've got some great forwards. We've got Batley. We've got oh, Fitzharding. Yeah. We've got Bragbury. We've got, we've got, well, we've got Dunn 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 coming We've got ranks. James but Dunn. Yeah, we've brilliant. got some quality forwards. I just feel You've like we've we got Lua too. We've got Lua too. be there next <laughs> well, year. No, he possibly. won't. And, uh, we we just got to get that balance right, yeah. haven't we? And yeah. we got Thacker, obviously. And we've got Capon, and we've got Ogre. You know, we've got some good players. It's but it, like anything, like Dave said, every single team has got the same yeah. goal, yeah. and they've yeah. got yeah. they're all driving for the same thing. They're all looking at recruitment. They're all trying to get the balance. They're mm-hmm. all looking at game plan. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to think that, like you said, I think we two point oh salary cap back up again. Yeah. But I do think next season is a big big season. Um, about we do want to start seeing us go up the table or, yeah. or maybe just play consistently to a game plan 
that, that we play to consistently? Well, I think that we're pretty certain that us as supporters can't face another year of, oh. of doldrums and and, no, no. and inconsistency and underachieving again. No. Well, this leads me to maybe the last couple of questions that kind of link together. So we had Neil Dreyer, I think is how you say it. He said, other teams are playing behind closed doors in friendlies during the Six Nations, are we? And if so, so who are against? And linked to that, I'll just bear with me, Bertrand Mopskickel. No, Mospickel. Pardon? Obviously not his real name. Sounds like one of your mates, Miles. Bertrand <laughs> got Mospickel, well. yeah. Uh, that was his Twitter handle. That's all it said. He said, should Bristol have all the razzmatazz build up, fireworks, smoke in abundance, etc., without any tangible success on the pitch? Because to me, it's just embarrassing. Actually, I don't think he is landed gentry because he wouldn't have put cos. He would have, because <laughs> in my opinion, yes, uh, yes, it's just embarrassing. Um, or he would say, in my opinion, one is embarrassed. But he's also said, shouting, we're amazing, look at everything we do well, apart from the reason we exist. Um, so I'd kind of bring those two together to yeah, say that, yeah, yeah we, we, we obviously had the Crusaders game that was planned in advance and in many ways was kind of planned as a, as a friendly within this time. And I do believe there's a Bedford, Bedford away, away game. Yeah. There's also, um, but, I mean, he has got a point with the Rasmataz. And, you know, you can argue we've got to do it. But as me and Miles experienced at the Crusaders game, it went a bit too far. And the uh, the hacker was facing the South Star, uh, facing the Atio, and nobody could see it because there was too much smoke. And I feel we are responsible for that with our big moaning about firework unspectacular uh, last yeah. year. They've overcompensated. But I do feel we've got to think, that we've got to remember that there's a clear distinction between what happens off that field that's yeah. got nothing yeah, to do exactly. with what yeah, happens yeah. on the field Pat is only, his, yeah. his concentration is what happens when we've got 15 on the field yeah. playing so all the fireworks and all the razzmatazz yeah. that is completely dealt with by yeah. by another group yeah. of people yeah, yeah, exactly. and we need to make that distinction I think so I think you're right I think the fact that we I think as fans we've just got to realise that Ashton Gate Stadium they they provide a, a, a provide a sort of facility don't they put on some razzmatazz and sometimes it can be a bit of disconnect between that and the rugby and the football. But then, but we don't know why. Uh, and if there's bad feedback about it, it just looks bad for the rugby or looks bad for the football. And that's what that's you know that's the the marketing that fans see. Well, hopefully the the implementation now of the new committee, you know, that we obviously yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. spoke about last week. Um, hopefully, this is the kind of barrier between hmm. you know what's going on with Ashton Gate Stadium and the team. So hopefully now we've got a, a board in place as such to yeah. to be able to kind of soften that stuff out and hopefully work out a, mm. a plan of attack. And if you don't know what we're talking about, if you look back on our little list of podcasts last week, I think it was, or the week, I released what I called a docu-pod, <laughs> <laughs> which was basically an interview we had with members of the, three members of the uh, Supporters Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. I just put it out as a, as just the interview. Um, so if you're not, you know, you don't know what we're talking about, have a listen to that. And and there is a, they've provided a Google form at the moment for people to put their mm -hmm. ideas in. And, and I guess the thing about that is that we do, even though it's four, it's only four meetings a year, there is a face to face meeting yeah. with people higher up in the club rather than just a kind of faceless survey. So it's, you know, my opinion, it, you've got nothing to lose. And if you don't get involved, then, you know, that's our problem, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, boys. I think we've uh, we've we've discussed some some nice stuff. Uh, considering the ratings, I was gonna. I, well, I was gonna come out to my last little ah, okay. uh, list of shout outs to finish. So mm -hmm. let's start with the He's Cubs under out. 18s. Coming out the come end. on, then, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we're talking about the gap, aren't we? Yeah. Between obviously the, the the Cubs to to the first team, and well, it's, it's not a gap really, as such as it is. It's, it's a complete void, really. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the introduction of, a, you know, an under-20 side, I think is a, it's a great idea. I mean, the thing is, everyone needs to be on board of it, mm. with it because otherwise, if you've got no teams to play, mm. it's pointless having an under-20 side. So, yeah. And I should theory, say that we should, I should doff my cap to Stuart Bennett on Twitter because he did ask this yeah. question which is what you've remembered yeah, and I sorry, forgot yeah. so it's my fault. He actually did make this point is that it seems like having a Cubs under-18 to the first team is a huge gap and yeah, that's not necessarily yeah. a Bristol's problem that's a premiership problem and it, it kind of seems seems weird that you can sign a load of under 18s who then don't do anything yeah. for a couple of years because in a way they're kind of 
in between two worlds, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and yeah, he said, Stuart said, obviously more of a national prem debate, but it does seem odd. And I think we agree. And I, I don't know, we don't really have the answer to that, do no, we? So, no, 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 no. And, and, I, and I, I also feel like throwing them in for, you know, the Premiership Cup games, all it's really done is just disjoint that competition, yeah. oh, hasn't it? Yeah, so it's yeah. great to, you know, for these guys to get, you know, exposure to, you know, to, the real world is such a, you know, a, a rugby, but it's just not really good for that competition in itself. Right. And I think an under 21s league would be fantastic. Yep. Yeah, I think, well, well, let's, let's hope that, I mean, this is going to be part of the bigger, de- dis- bigger debate about rugby sorting itself out generally, yeah. I think. And there's a yeah, lot to be said on that. Second league. Okay, yeah. boys. Well, look, let's, we've got a, f- a couple of shout outs to finish off with. So the first one is shout out to Harry Randall. Yes. yes. Miles, you, wanna, you were the one well, who... We found out I like, spotted Miles. Yeah, you know, yeah, a massive social media fan that I am. I spotted him on the train on the way back. He's been up great. Well, let's just say this week he was uh, called up to the England A squad, wasn't he? That we're yep. going to face Portugal. Was. And there was a bit of moaning that, again, Bristol have been overlooked mm-hmm. by the England um, selectors. Yeah. But since then, five have got today. He's been upgraded further. Uh, there's been an injury, I understand, to Alex Mitchell, yeah. um, and he's training now with the England squad mm-hmm. with, for the forthcoming Scotland game. Let's this hope Saturday. it's not on a paddleboard, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say that's the that's the inevitable <laughs> yeah. injury. It is winter. Way back, I think we might get away I mean, with that. And I got to say, that's a, that's like a leapfrog selection, isn't it? He's like, it is, it, it I is. Mean, fair play to to that. So it's, that's a big shout out for yeah. Harry Randall. You know, we think he's brilliant anyway, as Bristol yeah, yeah. fans. But yeah, he, like, he, he may not get any game what, time. He may not even get on the bench, but. Do you know what him. I like about that though is I like the fact that they think that he's an Alex Mitchell type scrum off. Yeah. And exactly. I like that because that's the sort of scrum off England need. Absolutely. He's a fast paced, yeah. lively, quick hands sniper. Mm. And if that's and that's let's give Steve Borthwick some credit then, because if that's that's where he's got to move with scrum offs. Yeah. Has to. Yeah. Yeah. Um second thing, we need to make a shout out for the women's team. Um yeah. Because they've got a big game coming up on Friday at Ashton Gate against Loughborough Lightning. And I should also say that I went to the uh, the game against uh, Exeter Chiefs a couple of weekends ago with my daughter at Shaftesbury Park to see us uh, take the Chiefs down yeah. uh, and play really well in the second half. Um, Not just the Chiefs, but they're annoying fans. They're fans as well. I was right in the <laughs> middle of it. Yeah, right in the middle. I mean, they were all right. We had a bit of banter, but it, they were a bit kind of vocal. Um, so I think... Yeah, the 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 the, the girl, then they they lost very narrowly to to Gloucester Hartbury last okay. week. Put on a big show. It seems to me like they're 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 kind of getting putting together a little bit mm. of a a run. I mean, I I looked at the table and thought they're going to struggle to get a home semi final. But as you said earlier, sometimes it's the team with momentum that can sneak exactly. through. So and of course, Friday night, Ashton Friday Gate, night Ashton Gate, tickets, it's, tickets are still available. Yeah. Um, I'm going. Um, so maybe next week. We may have a pod next mm-hmm. week where we do a little bit more of a deep dive into that game and yeah. also look forward to a big game against um, Saracens that they've got the week after. Yeah. So come on, the women, the Bears women. Um, we also need to have a shout out to uh, uh, um, Sarah Beaumont. And Sarah Beaumont, if you're Facebook group followers, you will know that she's the lady that does these amazing oh, um, sketches and cartoons linking to... Um, some of the games and she produces a calendar every year and, and she very kindly contacted us um, she wanted to give us a free calendar to say thanks for, for doing this we, we tried to meet her at the Bath game but it was too busy but Miles and me actually met her at the Crusaders game um, and uh, she handed over her um, handed over her uh, calendar and we we said we should want to say thanks. Where does the calendar out. reside now? Though? I've got it at home at the moment. <laughs> I don't know. We need to we find do a share it. Yeah, a couple of months. Yeah, we, we do like four months. months yeah, four months. I each. think so. I haven't quite worked that out. Yeah, <laughs> so definitely we'll share it. She around. was great to talk yeah, we're to. Really great a great fan of her. Pod. Yeah, they, they, it was the whole family. It was her, yeah. and her, her, and it was her son, and I think Andy, who was her husband, and then oh, hang on a minute. I said I was going to say their names, and I've forgotten them all. Oh God, they'll have to, they'll have to send us a message. And then a couple of other things I wanted to mention was that there is uh, an event happening at South Bristol Rugby Club. It's a girls open event um, that's happening quite soon. And I will post something about that on the uh, notes that go with this podcast because they asked us if we could uh, could promote it, um, which was great. Um, 
I was going to mention the fact that we spoke to the Supporters Advisory Committee last week, but we've already mentioned that. Um, And then I suppose the last thing I should mention is we've been a bit quiet about things, haven't we? But people might be wondering what happened to us in the the Sports Podcast Awards. Well, all I'd say is that, you know, we, we didn't come in the top three. But when you look at the top three, that the the fact that two of the top three were supported by huge corporations yeah. are kind and of commercial pods. And all three, three. I think it, it was it a bit was, of a travesty. And all three were actually uh, ex-professional yeah, players. Yeah, I, I suddenly thought, and I and I felt a little bit annoyed because I know a lot of people supported us and we promoted it, and people have come up and said they support, they they voted for us. And, and actually, I did email the the people that organise it and say, look, you know, it's fine, whatever, but. It would be nice to know how many votes we got, yeah. just so we can see like yeah. what the support was, and they haven't replied. Yeah. So I'm going to push that one a bit. I'm a bit man. disappointed with it, but it was great fun doing it. And, you know, we got a bit of coverage, and we got a mention on the rugby pod uh, from Big Jim Hamilton when he yeah. said Bears Beyond the Gate, banter. So maybe Jim will be our next interviewee on uh, Bears Beyond the Gate, if we can squeeze in time for yeah. him. So yeah, yeah. so, yeah, boys, I mean, we were glorious losers. <laughs> Basically, uh, yeah, it was I mean, a bit we... like the Harley Quinn semi final. That I think everyone just assumed we were going to win it, and, uh, <laughs> and then the pressure the pressure was put on in the second Absolutely. half, and we just lost focus. Our first we, season of the awards, we peaked never, too early. We peaked too we? early in the awards. We, we need I, to, yeah. I, I feel we need a, a, a new category actually, like yeah. independent, yeah, yeah fan, absolutely. Fan yeah, totally, yeah, I think you're right, yeah, but actually, that's not the last thing, Pete. Nope. Oh, isn't it? No, because I've just this is just hot off the press. Oh, this is from a good friend of ours. Mr. Matt Crew. Uh oh. And um, you know, you posted out a picture on our uh, Twitter page, haven't of you? Of us we're drinking just, uh, some beer, yeah. Yeah. recording the pod. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I think we're going to have to take offence with Mr. Crew here because. Because uh, uh, there's no like choice of beer. We've got a question. Uh-oh. Go on. Question is who's the slacker winging it with no notes, lads? Though man after my own heart, I will admit. Now, do you want to answer that, Pete? Because obviously. Me and Miles have got our notes. You know, we, we we like the old-fashioned well, way of uh, ri- writing a pen and quill. Yes. Sort of, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, all, all I would say is I got all my notes on my iPad. And that's so, the way you I mean, do it. That's all you need all, to know, Chrissy. Nothing, yeah. So, I mean, some of us have moved into the 21st century and uh, <laughs> using technology that is available. So, uh, well, And also, most of it is all done on AI, by the way. Do you not realise that? <laughs> chat, chat GBT, I just type it in and it all comes out. And it just writes your podcast. Yeah. Love it, but love in it. all fairness, it's good. it was good to see him back, wouldn't it? Was, it, it, it was, the, uh, yeah, in the, yeah. last, uh, the last home game, because uh, he's been in hibernation himself, hasn't he? So, yeah, yeah. Winter's well, nearly over. We'll see him yeah. again soon. Welcome back, crew, Ian, uh, and thanks for... For, uh, chipping in with uh, with the banter, mate. <laughs> well, I think on that note, boys, we need to finish. We've got a little bit over the time we hoped, but obviously there was quite a lot to talk about. What with Dave and everything, so I think we'll leave it there. We'll do our, our standard thing, which is uh, um, stay safe, have a good week, or no, have a good week, stay safe, and come on, on Briz. Bird.